All right, welcome to the pod presented by Invesco QQQ. It is overreaction Monday, and it is Monday we're taping this. We will normally have this out for your start of your work commute Monday morning, if not sooner, sometimes Sunday night. Um, but it's Tuesday. You can be your Tuesday morning, whatever. It's when we run through everything uh, that happened over the weekend. And uh, we're going to we, we delayed it a day because of the the big matchup in Orlando, Florida State first LSU. And uh, this was a beat down at Disney World, Florida State Seminoles are back. They dominate the second half of this game against LSU score 31 consecutive points at some point uh, look absolutely tremendous as good as they've looked in a decade. Uh, LSU, meanwhile, has all sorts of questions. Pat, what happened last night in Orlando? I will start with you. Wow. Uh, great credit to Florida State for rising to the occasion, putting it together in game, really, because it was kind of fits and starts. And I mean, it was a really interesting game. All kinds of stuff happened. And for a half, maybe even more than a half, it was kind of a jump ball game. And I thought it was going to come down to who could make a play or two at the end. But no, Florida State locked in and started executing, especially offensively, and just absolutely blew LSU away to the point where I felt like LSU quit late in that game. So great job by Mike Norvell. And he said he told his team at halftime, he said, I promise you we will score every possession in the second half if we just take care of the details. And they did. They blocked better. They stopped dropping passes. Jordan Travis settled in a little bit more. They have got a lot of weapons. Uh, they're really talented. And frankly, I thought this was not just, as you said, their 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 biggest moment really since 2014, but they needed it because their school had spent so much time shooting off their mouths about how they were basically too good for the ACC and they need more money and they need this and they need that, that they needed to back it up on the field because they hadn't backed it up in years. Uh, now, it was lined up for them. They had brought in a, you know, they had a huge year in the transfer portal. Uh, they had players stay who could have gone into the draft. And so they put it all together and backed up the board of trustees and the school president and everybody else who basically said Florida State is too good for the ACC and is one of the back among the elite. Well, now they are. Good job, Florida State. Yeah, it, it uh, you know, they picked on LSU's weakness going in, uh, which is the corners. Uh, and they just, they just ate them alive. Uh, the, give credit to you know the coaches obviously for, for scheming that up at florida state but man they, they've got some really big weapons jordan travis played pretty incredible his numbers are insane at 340 passing yards i think he only you know missed on like eight passes and there were probably four drops and and then his two weapons johnny wilson uh six foot seven uh receiver who who uh uh you know he had a couple of drops but uh Obviously, he's, he's a huge target, and he was open, it seemed like, every play. And then Keon Coleman, transfer from Michigan State, Louisiana guy, uh, ran into his family uh, outside the locker room and, and wrote a little bit about him and his family and how much they were looking forward to a game against the home state team, and he really excelled, right? Uh, 119 receiving yards, nine catches, uh, you know, first-round type material uh, going in, and clearly didn't didn't hurt himself there so they had a great game plan uh it, to to expose lsu's weakness and boy they did it and they got an incredible performance from a louisiana guy against uh against the tigers so uh your column was excellent off the game uh ross on uh on yahoo sports I encourage anyone to go check it out you just ran into the whole all this reporting was done right then all these quotes <laughs> Yeah, it, it kind of yeah. helped that uh, that he was a Louisiana guy, and yeah. I spent a lot of time in Louisiana, so I kind of had connection to some of his people. And um, his AAU basketball coach, I reached out to him, you know, in the middle of the fourth quarter or so, and then he uh, he was at the game, and uh, so got to see him, and kind of just was Went looking for the family in the yep. holding area where the parents go, and so they were all there. His brother was there, and his his mom and a couple of his like friends. And, and so was able to kind of chat with them a little about the game. I mean, it meant, it, it meant a lot to them. Um, 
Obviously, they're from Opelousas, Louisiana, about 50 miles west of Baton Rouge. Uh, he wasn't offered a scholarship by LSU coming out of uh, coming out of high school. He was a two way player, so you know he wanted to play basketball in football in college, which would have been hard at LSU. And I, I think that was um, I don't know. There were two things going against him, right? That because uh, I don't think LSU was a fan of of him playing both um and then two was he was just a raw talent i think he was a little uh uh you know kind of developed late a late bloomer uh so to speak uh because he only started playing football like in eighth or ninth grade uh, and so he was a basketball star uh really all all throughout his childhood and went went to michigan state for a couple of years obviously broke out of uh broke out last year and uh you know, played at played basketball as a freshman too at Michigan State, but not much. Uh, and then didn't play his sophomore year because he transferred out. And uh, yeah. you know, he he transferred uh, tra- obviously transferred to Florida State, and and yeah, it, the the rest is history. Painful loss for Michigan State, whose offense mm. could yeah. use a key on Coleman. Yeah, um, three touchdowns. Uh, he was unbelievable. We get to this in a sec, um, but. Um, We'll get to the LSU defense in a second, but this quote from his uh, his mom uh, was it was it Raven Raven Savoy, yeah, um, yeah. God says make your enemies your footstool. <laughs> he did that. He did it He's against <laughs> LSU because LSU didn't offer him. I I don't know. What recall God saying that? Maybe he did though. If he didn't, that's a gr- I, I love that line by God. Nice quote by God. <laughs> <laughs> well there's that been god, some uh, god can turn a yeah. phrase now god there's knows been... how to t- he's got a way with words god uh, uh great been... quote god uh... and great quote i mean this is god says make your enemies your footstool this is like some stuff out of like what of like an action movie right <laughs> yeah it's uh like there's fiction. been some criticism uh of the of the attribution there of, of that uh, of that quote to oh, god really? uh apparently uh it was yeah <laughs> wait god wasn't quoted for crop- <laughs> i wish quoted the only I don't thing that is- holy war here but there's <laughs> yeah. a scandal we've had wars leviticus, gone on. leviticus uh, chapter three got well, it all wrong which book that spoke to god did not have, he said god said rain hell down on them pur- those purple tigers Yes, yes. Well, apparently it was in the neck. Bible, but uh, not, not yet. Yeah, I can play neck. Got, apparently it was in the, but the po- quote was in the Bible, and I did find it before I wrote it. I found it in the Bible. However, God really didn't say it according to the Bible, but it is in the Bible. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, Psalm one ten one. I guess is is oh, the we line. Have many the, pastors whatever. listen to oh. this this show. Yes, yeah, we do. I'm sure Pastor we'll Conrad. Pastor I'm Conrad. Sure. Yes. Please yeah, they'll uh, correct us. Pastor Conrad will let us know. He's a, he's yeah. a dedicated listener. Uh, um, I love some of these comments, by the way, because <laughs> this is such a true comment here to the story. College football brings out some wild takes about God like few other things can. And it's so true. It's so true. Uh, I mean, this quote is just fantastic. It's it's true by the Bible about of God. the college football inquirer. It is true. Com- anyway, speaking of someone who needs the help of God, Brian Kelly, by Ooh. God, what was that? First off, how does LSU not have any quarterbacks? Like, Quarterback, what? Yeah. Not quarterback. Yeah, they, they had a quarterback. Yeah, guy was running for his life. Yeah. yeah quarterback. He was really good. This is the place yeah. that has like just an assembly line of six three dudes with like long arms and like what happened there? DBU. Yeah. No DBs right now. Um Harold Perkins does not he plays linebacker in this game. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know what he was doing. He's just kind of like he wasn't an impact. Their offense gets stopped twice in the uh in the red zone, right? They had two red zone stops. Yeah. This was an absolute mess by uh by LSU. What I, I mean, I I had a pick to win. I had Jaden Daniels winning the Heisman. I had <laughs> I had LSU winning the West and in the playoff. I couldn't God treated me like a footstool on this one. <laughs> well, uh no, it was a mess for LSU. And the funny thing is, like, yeah, they Boy, they left points on the field with uh, some fourth down short yardage uh, 
mishaps early in the game, but they were still, they were in position, man. I mean, they were winning 17-14, and then they just absolutely got pushed around, stood up, slapped down, beaten in coverage. And the one thing about Keon Coleman, Keon Coleman makes hard catches. He he wins contested catches uh, at a very, very high rate. I don't know if there's anybody else in college football, maybe Travis Hunter, who we'll get to. Uh, who can just beat the guy who's covering him for a ball that's a jump ball. And by the way, Mel, Mel Tucker had some things to say about NIL, which uh, probably contributed to Keon Coleman transferring to Florida State. And Mel mm. said they basically need more money for NIL. Well, I, I know a couple million they could come up with yeah. off of Mel's salary. <laughs> yeah. Not, what is it, nine and a half? Personally. I think it's nine and a half million. Yeah. Yeah, nine and a half million. What are you getting out of that? Let's make him a seven and a half million guy and see if he can pay some players. And the eighty Anyhow. million dollar locker room and facility. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't want to hear M- MSU claiming they're broke. We'll talk about this another time. If Mel keeps like, mm-hmm. well, then raise the money, Mel. You get the like fifty thousand. Yeah. Again, hundreds of thousands of alums, billionaires. Like, yeah. you'll be crying poor. No, poor little Especially- old Michigan State. Right. <laughs> when you're one of the highest paid coaches in the country, don't be saying you're poor. Um, anyway, but no, Brian Kelly's after the game. Wow. He just like did everything but pull out a sword and swan dive on it. I, the quotes that he gave, uh, reflected, I think, profound dismay over their, uh, their performance. This is what he said. He said, we're certainly not, we certainly were not the football team. I thought we were, I take full responsibility for not having our team playing the football. I thought they would. This is this is a total failure from a coaching standpoint and a player standpoint that we obviously have to address and have to own. For some reason, we thought we were somebody else. We thought we were the two-time defending national champion Georgia Bulldogs or something. I don't know. We were mistaken. It's like, wow. I mean, and here, th- this, to me, Notre Dame fans seized upon this as, oh, Brian Kelly's throwing his team under the bus again. No, he threw himself under the bus first and foremost. And I think throwing the players somewhat under the bus is perfectly allowable in this instance. They quit. They stopped playing hard in the fourth quarter of a huge game in the season opener. So from an LSU standpoint, woo, it was not good. Now, the good news is you just lost to a great team in a neutral but not really fully neutral setting, and you've got the SEC schedule ahead. If you win out, you're going to be fine. Uh, If you even just get to the SEC championship game, 11-1, 11-1, which won't be easy, but if you can do it, you'll be in the playoff hunt. So, uh, but the, you know, people love to panic and LSU fans especially love to panic and they got reason to panic a little today. Yeah, the Harold Perkins thing is really weird. Um, they kind of, they shifted him, like Dan said, it kind of more of a, more in coverage. I, I believe pro football focus charted, you know, they they chart everything. Um, and I mean, and th- this the, is the one of the premier for people that are forgetting who Harold Perkins is, and I, you know, you shouldn't, but he was a dominant freshman year edge rusher. I think there was one game he had four sacks. Mm-hmm. He is he destroyed a destroyed Arkansas. Yeah, destroyed Arkansas. He is a guy that comes off that edge and gets it. And when you have bad cornerbacks, you need a pass rush. And yeah, what what do you have on Pro Football Focus? He was playing yeah, sitting they, in the middle, playing like just he, zone coverage or something. I don't know what he yeah doing? I mean a lot of times last year he was most successful when he was like you know QB spy uh keep the and he did some of that uh last night but PFF has um 28 snaps he was in coverage so roughly like more than a third of Florida State snaps he was in coverage which uh yeah doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense and, and it's probably why he rated out so poorly so according to pff as well he rated out number 19 of 19 lsu defensive players who they rated Yikes. as far as the score which is yeah, shocking i think they out out thought themselves on the strategy there like they're trying to make a really an a dominant player even more dominant or get him in a better position maybe he can yeah. him, but at the you lose there just isn't another harold perkins out there um uh, all right can I can I issue a mild, not really dissenting opinion, but another part of the Harold sure. Perkins thing here? While I absolutely agree that I would I would prefer him in a place where he can attack the backfield. He had that one game against Arkansas, yeah. and other than that, 
I mean, his stats were good, but they were not. It was not a Will Anderson sort of stat thing. I think it was a case of one team that absolutely failed to come up with a way to block him. But other than that, he had a game with one and a half sacks last year against Mississippi State. He had a game with one against Mississippi, one against Alabama, and one against Purdue. He had zero sacks in two, four, five, six, seven, in nine games. Uh, I So, I mean, it's not like he was a game-in, game-out wrecker. Uh, I, I still i am not sure why they changed his uh, position, but I think he was the product of looking really fast on the field and running people down and destroying Arkansas. He's a good player. I'm not sitting here saying he's, you know, the next coming. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Coach Prime, story of the weekend, undoubtedly, could not really have had a better <laughs> opening act. We did not know what this team would look like. Uh, so many transfers. They end up being physical. They play a, a, a sharp brand of, of football on both sides. Shador Sanders, 38 of 47, 510 yards, four TDs. Travis Hunter, the two-way, the former number one recruit, plays over 100 snaps in the game, uh, 119 yards receiving on nine catches, has an interception, immediate, you know, just incredible two-way play. Dylan Edwards, the kid they flipped from Notre Dame at the end, the running back, had the big game winner. Everything went good, though. The uniforms look sharp. Like, those things are badass. The post-game press conference of, of Coach Prime just being absolutely outrageous. Loved every moment of it. I got receipts. Like we, I, we said we're coming. Who's doubt the whole thing? The absolute, just every single bit of this thing I thought was fantastic. Ross, you were there. What? Uh, but outside of what happened on the field, what is memorable about memorable? Oh, forget it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what stood out? Mm. What stood out? What do there you remember? You, uh, you know, we got a show on the field. And then we got a show off the field in the press conference, of course. Uh, Prime delivering as he often does. I uh, Even before he walked in the press conference room, you could hear him down the hallway. I got receipts. I got receipts. Uh, he must have said the word receipts 25 times. I figured he actually would show up with, with a prop and actually have receipts in his hand, like literal thin, you know, white receipts yeah. and just like, throw them at us or something. Missed um, opportunity. But, I know, I know. Uh, and I was texting some people in the locker room hoping that they actually had real receipts in the locker room. Sadly, they didn't. They did have a DJ. They brought in locally from Dallas to, to uh, DJ in the locker room, of course. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, but Dion cut that DJ off when he started speaking. In fact, it was pretty loud. And so he told, he, he yelled at them, cut that DJ off, cut the music off. I'm talking. And uh, it was quite a 15 minutes of a press conference, right? He... Um, he, for some reason, targeted Ed Werder uh, of ESPN, who covered him at the Cowboys. Uh, I saw what you wrote. He called it bull junk. So I'm sitting there trying to write this story after the Did press Did Ed Werder write anything? What, yeah, wondering what Ed Werder would have written. I started Googling around, whatever. The only thing that comes up is back in March, Ed Werder tweeted about Deion Sanders, and it, he described Deion as a celebrity football coach uh -huh. and i assume even though that's fairly benign, that dion did not take that well at all so he called it bull junk and uh and kind of uh asked edward multiple times if he believed and edward responded in what and then dion said you don't believe next question it was something um, it was something. So this is, this uh, is really a faith based episode of the college football <laughs> inquiry. We've got God's stools. We got. Yes. Do you yes. believe? Yeah. So uh, it was entertaining. But but on the field, obviously incredible. Like just we I think, you know, everybody was in the press box and we mostly all had the same responses to everything going on, which was like, what the hell? Right. Like nobody expected the firepower in the explosiveness from the Colorado offense. And it was incredible. He's got, you know, he's got three really great players there. Sh Shadir Sanders, uh, Travis Hunter in the, in the running back, right. Dylan Edwards. I mean, they, they, they were electric. Um, and it was, it was really, really impressive. Their issue this year will be defense and special teams because offense will not be there. They're going to have to outscore teams, which is going to be fun in the PAC 12, right? Cause the PAC 12 is, uh, 
loaded offensively with great quarterbacks and um you know in the fi- it's it's fitting right in the final year of the Pac-12 probably would be the league's best and most memorable season uh you have Dion and in his offense and all these other quarterbacks so uh it should be interesting to watch the rest of the season Pac-12 went 13 and 0 Hmm. Uh, so far this year, it's the best start by a conference overall in like 50, 60 years. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, not bad. thanks for coming. As a, <laughs> yeah. uh, as our sure. as our friend Stuart Mandela, the athletic said, "Can someone get Apple back on the line?" I know. <laughs> <laughs> if this was done two years ago, the TV negotiation would have oh. been different. Yeah. It, it, it it's this is going to be a footnote to history that if they mm. just had this year uh because we'll get back to prime but like you watch these I mean, washington was really fun exciting team to watch usc like it, you i mean they they were dominant this weekend yeah and not just Oregon against bad teams yeah. yeah you know i mean oregon state boise yeah. state looked pretty good and they still just got housed right so there was a lot going on there in the past all right your thoughts on coach prime and the uh, the Buffs big weekend, Pat. I will. I would like to make a motion that we just become a Coach Prime podcast. Until we kind of were all off season. We, yeah, we? Well, we were. We talked about him as much as anybody. But now, oh God, this is just like unbelievable. I, I was watching that. Like, let's just do the podcast right now during yeah. the game. Let's do an in game podcast. Let's do a halftime podcast. Let's do an immediate post game podcast. Then I read the quotes. Oh, let's do another one. Because it was just like so much content coming so out of fun. that game. Yeah. I mean, I've been sitting here trying to come up with a coach who walks into a new situation and delivers as well as he did. And you can go back. Jimmy Johnson's first game as coach at the University of Miami in 1984. They beat number one Auburn when they used to have the kickoff classic. But that was Miami. That in Colorado. That didn't take an over 1-11 and team. Danny Ford's first game as the full-time head coach at Clemson beat Ohio State and Woody Hayes in the Gator Bowl when Woody Hayes decided to punch somebody. Uh, but that's <laughs> Clemson. I mean, what what they did is incredible. Three touchdown underdog on the road, TCU coming off playing in the national championship, and TCU may have some serious issues. But still, you walk into that situation, you talk all the talk, and then you walk that walk that they did. That was impressive. That was incredible. And that was that was not just a bunch of athletes out there saying, whoop, we're better than you. That was execution, poise, performance in the crunch, offensive line that everybody thought was going to be terrible, stood up. Defense, as Dross said, wasn't very good, but made a key stop at the end. Uh, that's a well-coached team. People need to say that. And there's going to be a lot of people that have a lot of problems with Dion and the way he does stuff. But he, what he does... He says out loud what a bunch of other coaches think. You think there aren't a bunch of arrogant men in this profession? They're all arrogant, and they're all sitting in the locker room saying what he's saying. Yeah, nobody believed in us. Ah, you know. (laughs) The stuff that he said at halftime about Travis Hunter being a Heisman, he if he (laughs) he catches a couple things, the Heisman's in the crib chilling. (laughs) Other coaches would not say that, but they'll be thinking, yeah, we're going to promote this guy for the Heisman. He just says it out loud. They're going to start picking saying fights with the, Yeah. Picking fights with the media. Yeah. They all, there was a lot of coaches that would love to do that. And some actually do. So what he, Dion is just, there's no filter. There's nothing holding him back. And he is a force of personality. And yes, what is this going to do for recruiting? What's this going to do for roster building? You look at him, you look at what uh, Texas state with GJ mm-hmm. Kenny brought in 50 players. They go and win by double digits against Baylor. I mean, I, we'll see if it can be sustained. But now the stakes and the stage keep getting bigger for Colorado the more they win. And we'll see what happens in Boulder against Nebraska. Yeah. And look, it's going to be a hard season. There is, this is a great league. So, yep. you know, and that was always our thing. Like, gosh, you know what? Um, you know, it, 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 it's interesting. You know, he's people doubted him. This podcast definitely did not. I mean, I was, no. we were hyping him to be the Auburn coach. We thought he should have been the oh, yeah. Arizona state coach. You know, I, I completely believe in him. The whole, the whole thing on Dion. Well, he wanted HBC because he had better players than the other teams. What the hell's Nick Saban do? What's urban Meyer do? <laughs> like, of course, that's the whole point. The whole point is to get better players than the other team. Why wouldn't you? 
Like there's like some coaching note. Like they always give coach of the year. Wasn't it? Wasn't it like I think Ryan Day finally did it. But wasn't there like 30, 40 years Ohio State's coach never won Big Ten coach of the year? Yeah, because it's like, well, they got all the play. Well, that's the point. Yeah, it is the point. Get the better players. Like, you know, hey, how's Bill Belichick doing without Tom Brady? It's not going so well. Not going quite as well. It really helped when I had that guy. Um, it's it's just such a ridiculous concept. I don't know how many people really hate Deion Sanders. I think it's just going to be a little bit blown up. There's some old, there's always some old timers that are going to dislike this. That but I, almost everyone I know thinks this is just a great. It's a breath of fresh air. It's something different. It's something yeah. new. It, it it's totally wild. He you know and and I think as big as his recruiting was last year, he won't bring in as many guys. He has not killed it in high school recruiting yet. They are not landing elite players, but guard your flips, man. Ooh. The late flips. I mean, you watch that. This man, I did a column at the Super Bowl. We talked about it, but if you didn't listen over the winter about how charismatic this guy was, De Deion Sanders goes to Super Bowl Radio Row, and I follow him around for like two hours. And, the uh, and you know, they have all the guys there to pitch a product. They have, you know, NFL Hall of Famers, everyone's doing these little radio bits and little video bits. I, you know, uh, do a deal with the uh, Vesco QQQ or something like that, right? Um, <laughs> but you know, Visa, whatever. I'm here to sponsor the, you know, whatever the uh, Miller Light, and they've got. I mean, you got Montana there, you got Barry Sanders, you got everybody. And I watched like Michael Strahan run across Radio Road to get with Dion, Emmett Smith run across. Like, the the Hall of Famers were flocking to Deion Sanders. Yeah. Among the gold jacket, absolute A-list, coolest people, he's he's the pinnacle. He's the one they want a moment with. The charisma on the guy, I can't even imagine if I am a kid sitting around going, I need to transfer, or I'm a high school recruit, and watch that and go, I won't be part of that. Like that, yeah. that looks fun. <laughs> this guy. He's hyping his guy up for the Heisman. He's talking a totally different language. Absolutely love it. I, this could be, if, if he sticks where he's at or wherever he's going to get, hell, I don't know if he's got to leave Colorado. I don't even know if he does. I mean, he could load up on the in the transfer portal in December because I think every kid watching that was like, shoosh, it's a lot more fun than what I got going. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter where he's at. It seems like right. He's done it at Jackson State. Yeah, he's done it at Colorado. Like with these the player acquisition. So, yeah, it doesn't matter. He he seems to be able to attract talent anywhere. And let's not uh, look past what they did and what Sean Lewis, the offensive coordinator, did just schematically and in, in calling a game. Um, you know, he's he's pretty well respected. Sean Lewis is among among you know the coaching community. And uh, he was at Kent State for a few years, actually had a lot of success there, or at least had some success there, which at Kent State uh, was fairly unusual. Um, so he, uh, which you don't see a ton, he left a you know, head, FBS head coaching job and joined Dion because I think he believed, uh, unlike all of us in the media. Uh, and, uh, and so he probably thought this would be a better launching point for, you know, a major head job for him and right now it's off to a great start sure is everybody watching uh all right we'll be back right after this message all right uh sec went one in three this weekend the vaunted mighty it just means more mm. sec one in three against power five opponents the only victory was tennessee defeating virginia uh, and uh, Joe Milton, our favorite Joe Milton, looked looked pretty good in that game. Twenty one of thirty for two hundred and one, two TDs, had some nice passes. Cannot wait till NFL draft uh, draft experts try to wrap their mind around Joe Milton in a year. He's he's, he's befuddled us all for years, but he did look good. Uh, other than that, not so good, not so good. Uh, North Carolina beat South Carolina thirty one seventeen in Charlotte. We already talked about LSU getting beaten uh, handily, and uh, Utah just pushes Florida around uh, up in Salt Lake City. Um, thoughts on the uh, SEC one and three, Pat? Uh, 
Oh, it was ugly. It really was. I mean, that, like you said, the, the, the three losses were pronounced losses. I mean, two touchdowns for Florida, two touchdowns for South Carolina, three touchdowns for LSU. And those were all games going in that people thought, uh, oh, jump ball or the SEC should maybe win. I thought Florida was maybe the worst performance of any team in the country on uh, the weekend. They were way back on Thursday. If you don't remember, I mean, they were awful. They couldn't do anything right. Penalties, misfires. Graham Mertz looked very much like the Wisconsin Graham Mertz. Uh, and Billy Napier kind of did an interesting thing coming into this season. He started talking this team up. Last year, he was very much guarded, you know, like, hey, might be a while. We might not be very good. And they weren't. They were six and seven. This year, it's like, oh, you know, we've got a little more buy-in. We've got some more guys. We've done this. We've done that. And they flopped. I mean, that was a bad performance, in my opinion. And it's one game. It was a good opponent. But Utah didn't even have Cam Rising, their quarterback. I don't know whether Brent Quithy played or not, their tight end. Um, like, And Utah just absolutely was the better team for the entire 60 minutes of that game. So uh, Florida's got to figure some things out. That was, I think, very disconcerting to go through an entire offseason with a guy who's supposed to know what he's doing and building things up there. And if anything, you took a step back. Uh, that looked like some of the worst uh, Dan Mullen, Jim McElwain sort of performances there. Yeah. Uh, the SEC, we went through them, I think, three losses to a, a ranked team to open the season. You have to go back six years. You got to go back to 2017 from the last time they lost – one game to a ranked opponent in week one um so yeah not a not a uh not a great opener uh for the league and uh you got to think those teams lsu florida and south carolina you know are likely to to, to finish you know midway down or, or lower in the uh in the sec standings but we all we all remember that last year despite lsu's season opening lost to uh, Florida State. They ended up winning the West. It, it'll be interesting to watch. I was in the crowd the last few minutes of the game there in Orlando, and a Florida State fan yelled at an exiting LSU fan, go in the West like you did last year. So we'll see. <laughs> really put him in his place. Yeah. <laughs> Them's fighting words. Well, look, the SEC uh, obviously is a, has tremendous teams and all that, but part of their thing is the depth of great teams and this is this isn't uh i don't know you know this isn't vanderbilt losing they actually beat hawaii right. by seven but beat them um this is like the the heart and soul of the league like how good is a victory over florida this year how good is a victory over south carolina i don't know mm -hmm. um you know, so one of the things they've always been able to lean on is, well, look, we play all the good. We have all the good. All our teams are good. We got 10. We're 10 deep. Well, I don't know if you're 10 deep. You know, this is the way you got to you got to win these. Uh, you got to win some of the games. One uh, positive, um, and I, I'm befuddled by this, uh, Jalen Milrow, after all the consternation, all the Saban basically acting like he didn't have a quarterback. It was middle Tennessee State, but the Crimson Tide went 56 to 7. Milrow, 13 to 18 for 194, no picks. He had three long touchdown passes. He had two, two, he rushed for 48 and two more touchdowns. Um, looked pretty good. Someone asked uh, if uh, Saban, if this would carry over in the all season. He gave this great quote, not biblical, but this is a Coke bottle. You know, he always got that Coke bottle in front of him. This is a Coke bottle. It's not a crystal ball. Mm hmm. <laughs> Thank, 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 thank you, Coach. That's pretty good. You. Yeah, not pretty bad. Good. He's in his own way. Him and him and Dion are. Yeah, yeah they do that <laughs> Aflac thing. Um. Anyway, uh, Milrow looked pretty good though. Ross. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a QB uh, after him. I, I know. I the way Saban was talking about the quarterback competition. Uh, you know, you figure there would be some. More struggles there than there were. Yeah, pretty good numbers. 13 to 18, 194, three touchdowns, ran for 48 yards, another two rushing touchdowns. Some of the things they did, I just caught some of the highlights that was at the TCU game, but some of the things they did 
kind of reminded me of like, and he kind of reminds me, and this is not critical, <laughs> although some probably would take it as that, but he reminds me of like, remember, remember Blake Sims? Uh, wasn't it Blake mm. Sims that Alabama yeah. had maybe years yeah. ago? Is uh, Kiffin? Kiffin. Uh, it was when Kiffin was offensive coordinator. And they did a lot of. Uh, they did some different. That's when he was like evolving the offense a little bit. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I was just, I was some of the things they did with him too. Uh, and I, I wonder if they're gonna use that package a little more. What they, what they did with Blake, but, uh, but he obviously he's probably a little more talented, you know. And uh, yeah, I was impressed. Yeah, I mean, look, he he performed well, um, and really their their offense performed well. They only had like sixty four snaps, and this might be a product of, uh, you know, the way the game's going in terms of fewer plays. But they got a lot out of them. Average six point seven yards a play. Able to run well. Uh, you know, forty carries, two hundred and five yards, forty forty runs, twenty four passes. I think that's probably where Saban would like run pass balance to be it may end up closer to 50 50 when you play harder opponents starting saturday against texas but i think if they could avoid just throwing it all on milrow's shoulders and saying go out there and throw it 38 40 times a game they, they would prefer that so we'll see if they can kind of maintain that level of uh of, of balance of rushing and passing and also just having a bunch of backs that they can throw out there which they did showcase that which they usually have Big game, obviously, coming this week. We'll talk a lot about the rest of the week. Uh, Texas uh, yeah. will be there. Um, all right, let's talk a little uh, Big Ten. I went to the Michigan game. Free Harbaugh was the uh, was the. Oh, bit. my I, gosh. Not enough uh, cheeseburger signs or jokes. I was a little disappointed in that. Uh, J.J. McCarthy did wear the Free Harbaugh uh, deal. Also, in my endless quest to use this podcast to grift everything, uh, appreciate I got tickets from... Uh, ah! <laughs> unbelievable that's right diag partners that's right creating custom beaten. creating custom staffing solutions uh oh jason God. baronowski and joe sod took care of me with some tickets that's it i'm if you throw me something i'm grifting i'm grafting i'm that's right wow creating wow. custom staffing solutions right there i guess i yeah. can't get on you too much i, I have a grill out back uh -huh. you did you got that egg i mean we got to get something out of this podcast other than a headache <laughs> Um, anyway, Michigan was, was fine. Um, Harbaugh, I don't know what Harbaugh did. I don't know if he said what he did yet. I think he watched, he was talking about going to his son's soccer game, but that didn't happen. Um, I think he, I, I think he watched the game at uh, the offensive coordinator's house. Oh, okay. Him and Sharon Moore. Yeah. I was, mm. I was available to go over there, but then, then similarly uh, suspended the Sharon partners yeah. took care of me. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the two big stories, uh, other than Purdue losing was um drew aller penn state mm. uh beats uh west virginia 38 15 i don't think it was there's some questions about the neat new lines you guys can talk about but drew aller did look very good their quarterback which we expected he threw for uh 325 three touchdowns he had a 72 yarder there was uh he looks like the real deal pat thoughts on uh the nittany lions what we could glean from west virginia good or bad yeah, I watched a fair amount of that game um, flipping around there in that nighttime window, and I thought they looked good, and yes, Drew Aller looked good. He threw a beautiful bomb touchdown early on. Uh, they have weapons for him to get the ball to. They've got very good backs, but they've got receivers as well. A uh, couple times they bogged down in the red zone. Um, that's going to be a growth process, and the problem there is they had a kicker who missed a couple field goals. So uh, you need a reliable kicker to try to get to a college football playoff, but Drew Aller, he's lived up to the billing for sure in, in week one. Now, West Virginia could end up being a pretty bad defense. We'll find out. But there's nothing that said, oh, this guy's overhyped. He looked like the real deal. Yeah, uh, this game was, uh, uh, I guess, the uh, Gambleholics had their eye on, I think, Penn State scored with like five seconds left in the game, right, to cover the spread. Uh, and uh, Neil Brown, the West Virginia coach, who many believe is, you know, is, is uh, maybe in his last uh, season, and certainly this one didn't help, uh, was asked about how he thought Penn State, you know, ran up the score and scoring late. And uh, he said, uh, you know, it didn't bother me. And then he was asked a follow-up, and he said, no, it really, 
really doesn't bother me. I mean, I wouldn't have done it. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and he, so he kind of launched into like this, this 20 second, you know, uh, span about it. But uh, I wish we'd get, uh, hopefully we get this game a little more too. I, I love the, the border rivalry there. Um, and uh, I know we're talking about Penn state, but yeah, this, this one wasn't probably good for, uh, for Neil Brown's tenure, but uh big one for him in a couple I, weeks. I thought they out. did pretty. I, I mean, the first pit. half they played well. I mean, it was yep. 14, seven. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think if you went there, you West Virginia just hoping not to come in um, last. I mean, you know, you're trying to show something right, yeah. there. Um, I did not love the line play on either side of for Penn State. That would be my question. Um, mm. West Virginia was able to move the center of that line. And, I'm, you know, if they can, what's mm. Ohio State and, and Michigan going to It's just such an interesting season for Penn State because they got to prove it. Also didn't love the O-line play of Ohio State. So they go mm-hmm. over to Indiana. They clearly were completely confused by Tom Allen's trick of um, – having a secret kicker, the secret kicker. <laughs> um, they did have that. Uh, they did kick one field goal. I don't even know who hit it. I don't know the box score heads. Well, I guess we found out who the kicker was. They did not score a touchdown, so we never found out. 23-3, uh, to three, Ohio State wins. Kyle McCord, 20 of 33 for 239. No touchdowns. He had a pick. They only gained 380, 380 yards as an offense, which is not – Ohio State typical numbers. Not sure what to make out of this, but I certainly wasn't. There's a lot of consternation in Columbus over this offensive performance because uh, why not overreact to a 20 point victory? But they got so many playmakers, you expect a little bit more out of uh, Buckeye. So uh, I think Penn State's got their quarterback. I don't know that Ohio State does, Pat. I agree, at least not on the level that they are accustomed to because they have had some absolute ballers for like seven years in a row at that position. And now uh, it's a little bit more of a question mark for sure. Um, again, okay, but nothing great. And that's when, when Marvin Harrison, two catches for 18 yards. I mean, it's a guy people are talking about by far the best receiver in the country. And I don't disagree. Although after watching Keon Coleman, whoa, but uh, you know, I mean, him, Emeka Egbuka, Julian Fleming, Cade Stover, the tight end, they got guys that, I mean, you should be out there just picking your mismatches and taking advantage if you can. They've got three excellent running backs. So offensive line, not doing very well in short yardage. That's not a new thing with Ohio State. And then quarterback, just kind of a guy out there so far. We'll see if McCord can uh, you know, develop from there as his first start. Certainly no reason to pass judgment as far as uh, you know, what he's going to look like all year, but it was definitely not the same Ohio State offense we're used to seeing. Yeah, the the I didn't watch. I couldn't watch this game. I was watching the Colorado. Or, or I was right in Colorado and Dion. But uh, I, I remember looking back to the score and being surprised, and then looking at the stat line, and being even more surprised at, at two for eighteen when it came to, like Pat just said, Marvin Harrison Jr. I um, I don't understand how that happens in a game uh did i don't know if indiana had a great game plan defensively against him or kyle mccord is a new quarterback you know breaking in on the road uh i you know i don't i don't know if, if that had anything to do with it but a big surprise dan that the ohio state fans are uh are freaking out after uh, four quarters of football yeah i mean it's the whole point um chris freeman <laughs> was the secret kicker uh, remember, there we uh, go. Indiana okay. would not name their kicker, their first string kicker. Now we know um, Big Ten coaches plan accordingly, plan accordingly. A <laughs> um, couple items to clean up. The, my, uh, the Who is the real Miami? It was definitely Miami, mm. Florida. They kicked the hell out of mm. Miami, Ohio. Uh, thanks for coming up. Obviously, we had the, the that in the quote unquote confusion bowl. So there, there was that. Per, uh, you know, credit to uh, Fresno State. We'll mention that because they pull, they beat Purdue. They won the Mountain West last year, and they have a lot of guys back. And this could be a pretty good team. They beat, uh, went on the road and beat Purdue 39-35. Uh, um, they have a transfer quarterback, uh, Mikey Keene, at four touchdowns. So that was a big win for Fresno and the and the Mountain West. And uh, you know, as this as you know, we we didn't do an emergency pod on the Big Two, the Pac Two. But that Mountain West, as the sixth league, really could be, or fifth league, 
How many leagues? Fifth best league. Could be really good. Like adding Oregon State, Washington State to all these other teams. It's a, pr- it's a pretty good little league. You know, it's not, I don't know it's that far behind the Big 12, uh, particularly yeah. after this weekend. Well, I, I do want to give props to Fresno. I, uh, Jeff Tedford is such a good coach, and we always tend to forget and overlook and not think about him when you're naming off good coaches. He's just outstanding. He has done so well in his second stint now at Fresno uh, since coming back after being a Cal. And Jake Hayner was their quarterback last year, and he left, and I just thought, well, gosh, I mean, that guy was really good. You know, you're replacing him is going to be tough. I'm like, go get Mikey Keene, yeah, who was uh, – kind of a run pass guy at uh, UCF and they plug him in. He looks like a pure pass guy there. 366 yards passing, 70% completion, four touchdowns. Uh, That's very, very impressive. And yes, the Mountain West intriguing now. Uh, Gloria Navarez was out and about the commissioner. She was at Colorado State, Washington State. Mm Hmm. Wonder why. Then she was at San Jose State, Oregon State. Mm Hmm. Wonder why. Uh, trying to target, uh, yeah, she was cruiting, no doubt about it. Always be cruiting. Gloria was. So uh, what happens there? We will see as uh, as realignment continues to churn onward. Yeah, definitely. Um, a couple other ones we got to look at here. So speaking of the, the Pac-2, Oregon State, Washington State, um, they're all alone now. Just, to, just to, all they have is each other. It's, just, <laughs> it's an Adele song. <laughs> thinkers <laughs> the sad sad story we're going to keep track of how they do uh, just in conference play just the two of them and I, no matter i think oregon state could win the pac-12 well, we'll see but uh we want to present the uh the the pac-2 championship at the end of the year to whoever has the better season uh yeah, yeah it's sort of like that that commander in chief thing with yeah. their yeah that's just the, the, we're going to give the Tupac championship, the Tupac, the the deuce. Yeah. I don't know what we're yes, going to come up with right. something, but uh, both are one and oh, as we said, Pac-12 yep. won every game. Uh, so that that's good. We also uh, the Brian Ferentz keep my job. I need I, I need Iowa to average 25 points a game. This is in the contract. He must uh, Iowa must score 25 a game and win at least seven. They played Utah State 24-14. It's already behind schedule. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Not good. Come on. Now, I mean, it's just a point. It's just a point, yeah. but uh, that's Here, not good. Here's, yeah. And here's the thing like, after two possessions, they were on pace to score like 70. They scored touchdowns on their first two possessions, including their first season opening, opening drive touchdown since 1991. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine that. But they did. And then so everybody, oh, gosh, look, they're going to be so much better. And then eh, after those first two drives, not so much. So Ferentz tracker very much in play after week one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, I have an update on this bull that was driving in the car. Oh, good. Uh, I know it's nothing to do with the games. Uh, Howdy Doody is the guy's name. Howdy Doody is the bull. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Howdy Doody is from... Uh, uh, somewhere in Nebraska. Uh, I can't even. I don't never heard of the town. Obviously, um, Neely, Nebraska. Anyway, it turns out that uh, the Washington Post actually really got after this story and put some <laughs> real journalism into it. Democracy dies in darkness, and we're writing about bulls in in. in, in so you got something better to do, Washington Nor- Post? Nor- Norfolk, Nebraska. <laughs> Is there? <laughs> there must be no more government corruption going on. Um, anyway, the Washington, this is a daily mail. This is why I read the daily mail, not the Washington post. But anyway, they, they, they threw me for a curveball. So this guy who's got howdy duty, he wasn't transporting him. His name's Lee Meyer. He, he, he keeps howdy as a pet, <laughs> keeps him as a pet. And, and it, it's, uh, he, what he wasn't transferring him. Uh, his, he wanted to drive him around in a car, like a dog. <laughs> because like you know the dog we mentioned this dogs like to stick yeah, their head out the window yeah. and um his granddaughter said that he wouldn't be able to pull it off and he said i, I grandpa can do anything um i want to prove her wrong so he he took the um uh what was the car i forget now the crown vic he has a crown vic a former <laughs> former police car yeah, um, right. he reinforced the floor and the suspension and the frame he put a gate on the side added a plexiglass plexiglass barrier and then he rides howdy duty around 
around the countryside mm-hmm. for fun and gives them treats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, Every- Grandpa really can do anything. I'm impressed. He's bored. He's retired. He says, everybody's got to do something, right? I just got a little land and a little time, and this is what I decided to do. It's actually a heartwarming <laughs> tale of why <laughs> this, this old man and his bull. <laughs> old man and the bull. There you oh. go. The great novel. Howdy doody. <sighs> we were going to North Folks. Uh, North Folks. North Folks. North Folks. How do you say it? I don't know. North Folks. <laughs> Oktoberfest. Norfolk. Yeah. Did you just say uh, what is happening? Norfolk. Let's just go with Norfolk. Folk. Let's pre- folk. Yeah. Folk. Huh? Yeah. It's not F U C K. You sound like you're. you kind of did sound like that, didn't it? It did. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's bleep, probably a. Do I have to bleep that out? Yeah. yeah it's I think like, we're probably going to have to push the old bleep. I can't on that speak one. Nebraskan. I can't speak <laughs> Nebraskan. It didn't get flagged last week. I think we're still doing good. Did I say it the okay. wrong way? Did okay. I say it like that, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh we're oh, cruising. Yeah, last week. Yeah. I'm a mess. <laughs> Why do I have a podcast? I think uh, it's Diag, too, not Diag, for your people that got you your tickets. Okay. Yeah, all right. Diag Partners. Yeah. What is it? Diag. Diag. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just looking out for your graft. Man. Yeah, I know. I won't get tickets again. I won't get tickets again. All right. Diag. Um. Anyway, it's a, it's a heartwarming tale, isn't it? It is a heartwarming yeah. tale. Yeah. Look at that. A man and his bull. Man and his bull. All right. It's time, time to move on to our most innovative play of the weekend, courtesy of Invesco QQQ. Uh, Pat and Ross uh, and I will pick a uh, innovative play each week. And uh, and highlighted here, courtesy of uh, Invesco QQQ. And uh, the one I saw, uh, there was a whole bunch of them in the USC game. Uh, Caleb Williams had an incredible uh, performance. It wasn't just uh, he had five touchdowns and four incompletions, uh, yeah. but it was just the just the chucking it all over the field. It was a very exciting uh, time for USC. Um, Dante Moore over at UCLA had a couple of bombs too. So this is really heating up in LA. Uh, but they ran this play uh, in the second quarter. Lincoln Riley drew, drew it up. They're leading 28 to seven over Nevada. And uh, uh, I, I've never seen quite seen this play. He, they, they, they do play action. Williams looks right. Then he looks left. And the uh, running back that he had, uh, that he faked it to just run straight down the field just he, while 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 Williams is faking everybody out and confusing all the safeties and basically pulling each safety to either side he just runs right down the middle and they throw it wide open into him Did you see that play pat i did i loved it um you know lincoln riley certainly one of the most creative offensive minds out there and uh you know it's hard to to basically run a running back go route out of the backfield because there's too many people in the way but that's what you do here you spread them Spread the field, and you're looking the safeties off, which is so much of the game in college uh, football. And boom, you just send him straight down the middle, and he's open. And you got to have a guy who's fast and has hands, and they do that with Marshawn Lloyd there. And then, of course, Caleb Williams drops it right in on him. Love the play. Yeah, he he. Uh, it's like kind of like uh, it reminds me of like a wheel route, but in, instead of running around toward the sideline, he's just splitting the entire field and. Uh, uh, you know the the linebackers there in the middle. The two linebackers just kind of s- kind of bite a little bit and step up on the play action to the running back, and he just he just splits them right up the middle. It, it's a uh, cool cool play call, and uh, yeah, USC is going to be a force on offense uh, this year uh, when you look at the combination of weapons plus. Uh, Lincoln Riley. Yeah, this was this was one they they definitely had drawn up law off season and uh, pretty excited to use. You just never see a running back run that hard through the line and then not block anybody. And uh, yeah. yeah, he's just <laughs> wide, just wide open. So uh, there you have it. That's our uh, QQ Invesco QQQ innovative play of the weekend. So thanks again to uh, Invesco QQQ. We will uh, we will try to do that uh, every weekend. Time to hand out some hardware. Uh, you know, the Heisman trophy is, is handed out at the end of the year. People like to wait to vote, not coach prime. He is, he is <laughs> coach prime has trumped Chilling us on in the this. crib. <laughs> We've run the small sample Heisman for a number of years. I think Travis Hunter won a small sample Heisman last year. Mm. 
We yep. give one out every week uh, based on, you know, who we think should win the Heis- uh, the Heisman for a one week performance. Prime's given it out after a half. Or he said he could have. <laughs> he could have. I mean, I think one game. I think that's really that's the really small sample Heisman. We're going with small sample Heisman. Pat, who won your uh, small sample Heisman this week? Well, since I get to go first, I will take the overwhelming obvious choice, and it is Deion Sanders' choice as well, Travis Hunter. I've not seen a game like that in, in, with my own two eyes ever, okay? 129 snaps on a 100-degree day in Texas. That wasn't dabbling on one side of the ball, but mostly playing the other. That was full playing cornerback and wide receiver, 11 catches, 119 yards, had the pick, and that that interception was incredible. Athleticism, anticipation, and just nose for the ball. Great play there to stop a touchdown uh, and really help keep that game in Colorado's favor. He broke up another pass. He was in prime coverage on a lot of other big shots down the field. He ha- He was either... Uh, assisted tackle or solo tackle on a touchdown saving play at one point. I mean, Travis Hunter put on a performance we just don't see, right? Champ Bailey, I don't think ever had a game like that. Charles Woodson, I don't think ever had a game like that. Chris Gamble, who played both ways for Ohio State in 2002 and three, I don't think ever had a game like that. Can he keep this up all year? I don't know. But for one day, that's by far the small sample Heisman performance. Yeah, that's yeah, I the, think the one rest for sure. Just mentioning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to be diplomatic. Uh, concur. I, I haven't seen the hot, latest like Heisman odds, but I'm guessing trap him um, because, yeah, it was incredible. Uh, so mine, I'll go with a game. Actually, I didn't really get the chance to, to watch a lot, but I just saw a few highlights in the stat line. It's pretty ridiculous. Michael Penix Jr. Uh, for Washington, 29 of 40, 450 yards passing, five touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, ended up uh, throwing at least two passes to, what, eight, seven, seven players, uh, you know, spreading it around, and, and Washington just rolled Boise. So, uh, hey, Michael Penix Jr., a lot of, a lot of, a lot made of the uh, Bo Nix Heisman campaign with uh, the big billboards. In fact, I spent a lot of last week in Dallas, and there's one right in downtown Dallas, uh, Bo Nix. But uh, Michael Penix, uh, not uh, not mentioned as much, but uh, certainly off to a good start this year. And, and who knows? Maybe he's a little dark horse Heisman there. Dark horse. That's the Heisman. great thing. Yeah, uh, the great thing about Washington, they just they go deep. Because he's got the arm and they got the talent. And so, I mean, you want to watch a fun offense. Vertical, vertical, vertical. That that was that was a big-time performance. That was a really exciting game to watch us knocking back and forth on that. All right, I'm going to go with uh, Cincinnati quarterback Emory Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they they the Bearcats won 66-13 against Eastern Kentucky. So, you know, all, all uh, noted. But. The man scored seven touchdowns on Saturday. Um, he had six in the first half. Uh, the quarterback, he was, uh, th- they rolled all over uh, ECU, but uh, he uh, he had a, a touchdown run. He had led the drive. I mean, they just, they just moved the ball at well, but you throw, you get seven touchdowns. Uh, you win a small sample Heisman. I think that's just a rule. So, um, so the, they, they should have <laughs> grabbed him for Iowa. He would have set the <laughs> Brian Ferentz be sitting in tall cotton right now if he only had had that. So uh, Emory Jones, Cincinnati wins my small sample Heisman. All right. We say uh, a lot of mean things on this pod. I don't know that we said too many this week because we're all just excited for the first uh, first week of the season. But this is our chance to say something nice about someone. Uh, Ross, can you say something nice? Well, Based on the conversation post game about receipts, I guess <laughs> I'll speak for the entire doubting media and say something nice again about Coach Prime and the Buffaloes. Uh, you know, I think that uh, tw- they're a 20 and a half point underdog. I think if you talk to a lot of coaches in the 
coaching community, there was there was a lot of, of doubts. Um, there was a lot of criticism of, you know, how he's how he runs his program, the overhaul that he had that he that he took on the um, his approach with with uh, overhauling the roster. But man, uh, he put it together, and uh, and yeah, that's my uh, that's my nice. Uh, so uh, keep your receipts. Let's see after more than one game what happens. But the, the for CU now. train is rolling. Pat, can you say something mm-hmm. nice? I can, and I, I'm going to try not to get emotional while I go through this. So bear with me if I have to pause and gather myself on occasion here. But um, you know, in the in the big house on Saturday, <laughs> when um, you know when the Wolverines came out for that first play, <laughs> and they got in the centipede formation for Coach Arbaugh. <laughs> oh, it was so touching. I was so moved. He did die, right? Coach Harbaugh did pass away, or he's, he's in, in deathly ill. Is that in that the case, right? No, he's I mean, eating, like he's, he was eating steak and milk over the offensive oh, coordinator's house. Oh, oh, okay, oh, okay. I thought it was something <laughs> seriously wrong. You know, like we really were worried about Coach Harbaugh here, as opposed to a three-game self-imposed school suspension. Darn! I I guess I'm not going to say anything <laughs> nice about that after all. Well, that was kind of the funny part. Like you suspended them yourself. That was the free Harbaugh. Right. right. Like I think I bet JJ McCarthy has Ward Manuel's number, the AD. So if you really want to make a statement, you could just call the AD up or saw him around the building. Said, Hey, I think we should not. Yeah. Um, that's all right. You know, did I talk about uh how do you say it? Di- Diag or Diag? How do you say Diag. it? Diag. Diag. Yeah, Diag. I wasn't saying it right. Diag Partners, no. Creative Custom Staffing no. Solutions. So I, because of them, because of Diag Partners, custom creating custom staffing solutions, I was able to witness that moment <laughs> that live. Moment. It really was. It's something go. that will uh, mm. stick to me, stick with me forever. <laughs> um, I am going to say something nice. Uh, about Saturday night's late night game on CBS, Texas Tech at Wyoming. And this is the game that as much as anything else in college football, why I love college football. I don't know if either of these teams are any good. I don't care. (laughs) There was a team from Lubbock playing a team from Laramie. And it was on national television somehow. (laughs) And everyone was watching. It was absolute wild game. it goes to double overtime. Um, Texas Tech takes a, uh, I think it was 17-0 lead. Wyoming comes back, takes the lead. Then Texas Tech goes back. Then they go to OT. Back and forth. Um, Wyoming has this kid, Andrew Peasley, as their quarterback, who's just like, I mean, he's just Wyoming tough. I, I think he's from Oregon or something, but close enough. Um, the crowd, everyone in the crowd, like, okay, they show like the Alabama fans and all the kids are wearing like cowboy hats or cowboy boots because it's like the fashion. Yeah. These guys are wearing the kids in the Wyoming section are wearing cowboy boots because they just finished like bailing hay <laughs> and then came to the game. Like everybody wore their hat like unironically. It's like they're all just there. Like that guy looks like a cow, like a ranch hand. And he is, you know, it's like. <laughs> 30,000 people show up for the game, 29,000 people, okay? The entire state, that's like 5% of the state's population is at the game. It's only 583,000 people. They storm the field at the end when when uh, Wyoming wins. Uh, sea of sea of yellow. It's, it's just, it just was tremendous. It was, I, again, I think both teams could win four games. I don't know. It was extremely entertaining college football game. And this is what's so great about this sport. Two towns no one rarely visits. <laughs> In America, two schools most people don't really think too much about, and they completely entertain everyone. And that's why, no matter how much they want a conference realign this thing into two leagues, they never, I don't think they're ever going to be able to kill this type of stuff where you just have, you know what? It's just a great sport. It's just a great sport. It's just a lot of fun. And it was an incredible night for the University of Wyoming and Laradice, Wyoming. That's what they're calling Laramie now, Laradice. <laughs> It's just I, the whole thing just cracked me up. Just loved it. And that's what college football should be. You don't have to win the national title. You don't have to have a 
a, 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 a media rights deal. Are we making 38 million? We making 43. Just play football, get everyone out on campus on Saturday night, have some fun. Great game. Great, great job by Texas tech and Wyoming putting on a hell of a show. That is my say something nice. That's a good one. Well, there said. You go. it was great. It was great. All right. That's our show. Uh, we'll be back, uh, later this week for me to mispronounce all the words in the English language. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really not a good day for me. <laughs> the people that gave you free tickets, you mispronounced their name. I mean, no, nah, I got their names right, but yeah, the, the name of the, business. the company. Well, just D I A G. Okay. Just look it up. You can Google it and then Short you can get your- diagonal. Diagonal, because there's a diag in the right. at, at, at the University of Michigan, and that's it. So yeah. the diag partners, and then they're creating custom. You know, I, I, I say Invesco QQQ. Well, right, you did do that. I'm pretty good that's at Invesco important. QQQQ. Right, they're good. So anyway, we'll be back. I'll mispronounce some words. I'm gonna call Brian Kelly, see how he does it. Uh, we'll work on it. Too terrible, Massachusetts. <laughs> we do not learn English there. I don't know what to tell you. Uh. Um, but we'll be back. We're going to have a, a midweek show and then we'll have a race for the case. And then normally the overreaction day will be a day earlier, but I'm glad we waited for uh, FSU LSU. So season's off. Tell your friends to tell a friend and uh, let's get some listeners. We will talk to you later.